The topic for this month's training is trauma-informed care. This is a topic that became very near and dear to me when I underwent crisis intervention partner training as a member of a fire department in Ozaki County. Crisis Intervention Partner, or CIP training, is a companion program to Crisis Intervention Team, or CIT training, which is offered to law enforcement agencies. Both programs are sponsored by the National Alliance on Mental Illness, and they contain a curriculum that goes over mental illness and other topics so that agencies can better serve the populations that they are responding to calls for. The law enforcement version is 40 hours and the CIP or partner version is 16 hours on a variety of topics that are very useful to people who respond to calls for service involving people with mental illness in behavioral or emotional emergencies and also for people whose current emergency is caused by underlying elements like mental illness, post-traumatic stress and the like. CIP training starts with an overview of major mental illness. It, there's a segment on pharmacology of psych medications. We discuss special populations like veterans and PTSD victims, adolescents and youth, uh, elderly folks with dementia, developmentally delayed individuals and people on the autism spectrum. We also go over excited delirium and how to respond to those calls. And they bring in families who have been dealing with mental illness and also dealing with the response to members with mental illness by law enforcement and EMS agencies. There's also an excellent simulation uh, called Hearing Voices, uh, which is a simulation of what it's like to be bipolar schizophrenic and hearing those voices and trying to manage your daily tasks with that problem. There's also a segment on trauma-informed care, which we're going to talk about today. And then they talk about techniques for de-escalating psych-related calls, behavioral emergencies, and so on. There are a number of recommended topics as well, very important topics like suicide prevention and cultural competency or understanding the various populations that we serve. Lifestar has committed to try to bring this training to Washington County agencies. They're already doing CIT training, but there's no CIP program in the county yet. It begins with establishing partners with other agencies, law enforcement agencies and EMS agencies, and social and psychological service providing agencies. We're in the process of trying to get that going now, but we'd like to be part of providing this training to area agencies and forming a more close relationship with our other EMS agencies in the county. So let's talk about just that one element of this curriculum, trauma-informed care. Trauma-informed care is providing a system of care that's knowledgeable of and sensitive to the effects of trauma on the health of the patient, both psychological and physical. But it's not just about the patient. It's also about understanding the effect of trauma on the health of the provider, both physical and psychological, because we experience trauma when we go on some of these calls as well. It's important to understand what we mean by trauma because the traditional EMS definition is just an injury, a physical injury to a part of the body. This is Dr. Jamie Howard. She did a very recent and very good presentation on trauma-informed care for students that are currently either at home doing remote schooling or in the schools now in the COVID pandemic. Let's see how she defines a traumatic event. So first, a traumatic event is a situation in which someone is physically threatened themselves or they witness it in someone else. Um, or learning of the sudden shocking death of a loved one. Um, so basically, there's physical harm and danger involved in a true traumatic event. For a lot of people, the, the pandemic we're experiencing now is certainly a significant stressor, but not necessarily a trauma. And then for, for many people, it is a true traumatic event. 
Here are four types of traumatic stress injuries, and you'll notice that Dr. Howard's definition covers the first two of these stress injuries, some form of danger or harm, and also a loss. Take a look at these other two stress injuries, though, and think about what's going on in this country right now in an election year in which we are very divided, and half the country is looking at the other half thinking you are behaving in a morally reprehensible way your values conflict directly with my values and witnessing people engaging in behavior that conflicts with your values can cause a traumatic stress injury to you and then that last category of fatigue injury of the accumulation of stress after stress after stress without relief, just one thing after another. And the year 2020 is is really described by that perfectly, where it's just one stress after another stress after another stress with no relief in sight. These are possible experiences that rise to the level of a, clini a clinical traumatic stress injury for many, many people. So let's talk a little bit about how people respond to trauma. Trauma affects everyone differently. We all have our own different set of values and expectations and our perspective on life. Some people display symptoms that are similar to post-traumatic stress disorder or they actually do clinically have PTSD. Many more people will exhibit resilient responses or brief periods of symptoms that don't rise to the level of a clinical problem, but you're still experiencing these symptoms. The impact of trauma can be very subtle or it can be very obvious depending on the person. The important thing is to consider traumatic stress reactions as normal reactions to abnormal circumstances. The range of severity can be from very minor to very acute, but they should all be considered normal responses. It's, these are coping mechanisms that people are undergoing in order to respond to the trauma. Coping styles can vary from very action-oriented. There are people who just have to get busy, go back to work, go back to school, uh, or dive into projects in order to distract themselves and to cope that way. Uh, others are more reflective where they need to sit and think and experience what's going on. Some are emotionally expressive. They need to talk about it and share their experiences with others and join groups in order to discuss these things. And other people are far more reticent. They're just quiet and they want to reflect inward instead of express themselves outward. From a clinical standpoint, a response style is less important than the degree to which their coping efforts are successful in allowing you to continue your necessary activities, regulate your emotions, maintain your self-esteem, and maintain and enjoy interpersonal contacts. In other words, how you decide to deal with the trauma is really up to you as long as you really are coping. In the past, we've made the mistake of assuming that everyone needs to deal the same way with traumatic events, and that includes talking about it. So people who were exposed to trauma were not really considered healthy if they weren't expressing themselves and talking about it with others. In emergency services, we have the critical incident stress debriefing that's available after major calls and stressful calls, in the past, these things were mandatory, and if you went to the event and you chose not to talk, you were considered not dealing with the problem, you weren't coping, and this was unhealthy. We don't look at it that way anymore. The more recent psychological de debriefing approaches emphasize respecting the individual style of coping and not valuing one style over the other. So if you're the quiet, inward person and you don't want to talk about it, that is considered healthy as long as you're coping with your daily life activities. So just because you deal with the trauma one way doesn't mean your partner or your friend or family member or anyone else has to do the same thing. Some responses to traumatic events are immediate. Uh, 
and they can be less severe or more severe. Here are some of the common less severe reactions that occur in an individual rather soon after a traumatic event. And there are also some more severe responses that can cause a greater uh, intrusion into your daily life activities. There are also delayed responses that can come several months to many months after a traumatic event, including fatigue and sleep disorders, including nightmares, anxiety uh, surrounding flashbacks, overall depression, and avoiding emotions. Let's talk about how trauma affects your body and think in terms of not only as an adult, but think about children undergoing traumatic events who are still actively developing. Exposure to trauma can lead to a cascade of biological changes and stress responses. It can cause changes in the limbic system. The limbic system is a set of structures in the brain that deal with emotions and memory. It regulates autonomic and endocrine function in response to emotional stimulus, and it's also involved in reinforcing behavior. So you can actually undergo physical changes to your brain that affect your ability to control your emotions, and it can cause the secretion of various hormones uh, at the correct or incorrect time, leading to various symptoms and complications. The hypothalamus, pituitary, and adrenal glands all can respond and change in their activity as a result of exposure to trauma. Neurotransmitter-related changes also occur around your arousal and opioid systems, uh, which makes you far more prone for drug addiction, as an example. There's also the concept of being in a state of hyperarousal or hypervigilance. Uh, for those of us who've gone to paramedic school and studied uh, cardiac uh, events, including uh, MIs, uh, we are taught about hypervigilance after an MI. Hypervigilance is the body's way of remaining prepared after you've undergone a traumatic event. In case that event repeats itself, the body can respond faster. It can lead to sleep disturbances, a lower threshold for getting startled, and it can last for years. So for somebody who's had a heart attack, they experience some kind of bumper gurgle in their chest, and they have an immediate overreaction emotionally to that, and it becomes a stress response, which causes more tightness in their chest, possibly some shortness of breath, and a hyperarousal response which then feeds on itself again and becomes worse and worse and you become convinced that you're having another heart attack. That hyperarousal is a primary diagnostic criteria for PTSD. So people who've undergone that traumatic experience can have these physical changes and they can put themselves into that hyperarousal state which leads to these cascading anxiety reactions and physical problems down the road that need to be dealt with. Why am I stressing trauma-informed care as being important for first responders, not just the patients, but the responders themselves? Trauma can affect your belief about the future. You can experience a loss of hope, limited expectations about what life has in store for you, fear that life could end at any moment or end too early for you, and anticipation that normal life events won't occur. I'm never going to achieve the educational goals that I had. Uh, I'm never going to have significant relationships with people. Uh, I'm not going to get the promotion. My professional life is not going to work out the way I, I felt it would. These are all reactions that anybody can experience through a traumatic event. But remember that we are responding to other people's trauma, and that can be traumatic on us too. So all of these effects we find in emergency workers as well. That leads to an epidemic of suicide among police, fire, and EMS. More so with police, but also in EMS as well. And here's a comparison of suicide uh, versus line of duty deaths 
in police officers and fire and EMS people. Uh, you see quite a very dramatic amount of suicide versus line of duty deaths among cops, but it's also higher for fire and EMS personnel as well. More people die from suicide every year than from line of duty deaths, line of duty uh, injuries. That's a terrible statistic and is something that we are trying to address as a field and becoming trauma-informed organizations is one way of addressing that. Every responder is at risk for trauma. Trauma can come from many different sources and many times the trauma that you experience and the stress reactions that occur come from calls that you never would have predicted would be the call that causes the problem. So you need to be open and honest about understanding how you've responded to these calls. I'd like to share one experience with you. I'd like to share with you from my experience, and I think any experienced provider out there would say that there are calls that you're never going to forget. And they might be dramatic calls. It could be something about the patient. It could be something about the interventions that you performed. Uh, it could be something about bystanders. Uh, but there are calls that you're never going to forget. But that's not the same thing as a call that triggers a traumatic event for you. Calls that are dramatic aren't necessarily the highest risk calls for triggering traumatic events. You never really know what's going to trigger it. It has to do with you and your personal life experiences, your view of the world, and what kinds of buttons get pushed in order to trigger for you a trauma that would not trigger it in another person. You need to be aware of those things about you and also be observant of your partners and coworkers because you can never really tell which call is going to be the one that causes that trauma. For me, I've seen many, many suicides before, but there's one in particular that was a traumatic event for me. It wasn't a gory call. It wasn't a dramatic call. It was just the totality of the circumstances led to it being a traumatic event for me. This was a 19-year-old woman in the community in which I'm a firefighter, uh, who had been missing for a couple days and her family had been looking for her, police were looking for her, they were, uh, you know, the whole community was, was on alert for trying to find where she had disappeared to. The family had searched the garage before but the police decided they were going to take another look and when they went into the garage they noticed that on the far side of the second vehicle she had hung herself from the rafters using a bicycle cable lock. The family had actually been in the garage and had taken the other car several times during this, this two-day period and hadn't noticed that she was there. And there was something about that and the fact that the family had been looking and didn't notice her. And then when the police arrived and found her, they called me in to come in and confirm death. So they asked me to do a three-lead and uh, print out the, the asystole for them. I remember every detail of that call. I remember what she was wearing and the position of her body. Uh, and I remember the rigor mortis. And I also remember that her feet were in contact with the ground. And the thought that I had that at any moment she could have changed her mind and just stood up and stopped strangling herself. Uh, but she had become committed. She was so desperate and, and so depressed uh, that she was committed to performing the suicide. The totality of all of that is what pushed enough buttons to trigger a traumatic event for me. And I began reliving that call every day, all day, uh, for day after day for at least a couple months. Uh, and it also involved loss of sleep, and it was definitely a traumatic event for me. At the time, I didn't have access to an employee assistance program, and there was nobody that I knew to talk to. And I also had not been through the crisis intervention partner training where I was on alert for these kind of symptoms. So I didn't ask for help, and I just had to bear with it and deal with the trauma uh, by letting time fix it. Uh, that was, that's by no means a guarantee that, that this would have gone away over time, and it could have caused significant ongoing psychological problems uh, had I not managed to cope on my own. It's important that you recognize these kind of things in coworkers and yourself so that you know to ask for help and you know to offer help as well.
the person sitting right next to you in the ambulance might be going through these things right now, and you need to talk to them. So you interact and are observant, and you can spot the signs and symptoms and offer help when necessary. After my crisis intervention and partnership training, we did have a member on our department that had attended several suicide calls and became very obsessed and started reliving those calls. It wasn't just one call, it was several calls. Uh, he began looking up the social media for the victims. He was reading their obituaries and talking about these calls constantly, clearly having trouble with these calls. And because of the CIP training, I knew that he needed a referral. And that is what we're try I'm trying to do with this training is to get you to be aware and alert and to try and do what I can to make LifeStar a trauma-informed organization. So please be on the alert for these things and please pay attention to the rest of this training because this is important stuff. It's really difficult to give you a comprehensive list of everything you should be on the watch for when it comes to being a trauma-informed organization and caring for your coworkers and partners. You should be aware that certain kinds of calls might be a higher risk for putting somebody in a traumatic stress situation. But again, as I know from my own personal experience, it's not always the dramatic calls that are the ones that push all the right buttons to trigger something. So more important than focusing on what calls somebody has been on, you want to look at their behavior. Do they have any major changes to the way in which they're dealing with life or failing to deal with life? Are their coping mechanisms not allowing them to cope? Are they talking about things they've never talked about before? Are they behaving in ways that they've never behaved before? Uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean only uh, dark moods, uh, anger and frustration and expressing uh, negative things. People who suddenly have a totally positive orientation when they've never been that way before is a warning sign too. It, it's a sign that maybe they have made the decision to attempt suicide and they feel like their problems are about to go away. So it's a very difficult thing to give you a comprehensive list of everything you should watch for. But trust your gut, talk and interact with your partners and coworkers, and just be aware of the effect that this job can have on you. Because we care so much both about our patients and our providers, LifeStar is committed to being a trauma-informed organization. This is the fancy definition of a trauma-informed organization. The main gist of this is that a trauma-informed organization understands how widespread traumatic injuries can be and how subtle some of the effects can be and how alert we need to be to the effects that trauma can have both on your physical and your psychological well-being, and also making sure that we don't do anything as an organization that re-traumatizes somebody who's already had a trauma. So let's talk a little bit about understanding trauma, especially beginning early in life and the overall lifelong effects that trauma can have on a person. Understanding trauma begins with understanding what ACEs are. ACEs stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences, and this is a very standard term in the field of uh, social science and psychology. It begins with a very large study that was sponsored by the Centers for Disease Control and Kaiser Permanente, and it was called the Adverse Childhood Experience Study. It's one of the largest investigations of childhood abuse, neglect, and household challenges, and then the effect that it had on the later life health of individuals who were in the study. It was conducted at Kaiser Permanente from 95 to 97 with two waves of data collection. Over 17,000 HMO members from Southern California receiving physical exams completed confidential surveys regarding their childhood experiences and also their current health status and behavior. That's a very large sample size. And what they're doing is they're asking people after they've had this physical, uh, 
what kinds of childhood experiences did you have? And then they're comparing the findings of the current physicals and all the health problems that they have developed over time to the early childhood experiences and looking for both correlation relationships and causation relationships. The ACE study is a very significant seminal research in the field of psychology. About 70 research papers have been published about the ACE study in particular since 1998, and hundreds of additional research papers based on the ACE study have also been published. When you talk about ACEs, this is a core concept, and anybody in uh, public health and mental health knows what ACEs are and uses the term freely. ACEs are very common, but typically unrecognized. What presents as a problem in a patient may in fact be a solution that they're attempting and not the problem itself. For example, patients engage in smoking and drinking and drug use and other high-risk behavior. As an emergency responder called to the scene of a problem, we might view those things as the problem itself, when in fact, if we're trauma-informed and we're thinking about the environment and the life experiences of the patient, those things we see might actually be their attempt to cope with the problem, not the problem itself. The problem is, if smoking, drinking, drug use, and high-risk behavior is their attempt at a solution to a problem, and we attempt only to treat that solution, that can be a threat to the patient and cause them to resist, refuse, or flee from treatment. There are 10 types of childhood trauma that were measured in that ACE study. Five of them are personal, physical abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse, physical neglect, and emotional neglect. And five of those are related to other family members. So a parent who's an alcoholic, a mother who's a victim of domestic violence, a family member in jail, or a family member diagnosed with mental illness, and the disappearance of a parent either through divorce, death, or abandonment. So five of those are directly experienced by the patient, and five of them deal with people who were around the patient during their developmental stages. Each type of these trauma counts as one. And here are the actual questions, and I'll give you a minute to read through the questions that are on the ACES study. On this ACEs study, you would score one point for each one of these yes answers you gave, and in the end, that is your ACEs score. There are other types of trauma that somebody may have experienced that are not encompassed by the ACEs study, including racism, bullying, watching siblings being abused, losing caregivers, uh, and then different kinds of abuse between different family members that were not listed on the original ACEs study. The results of the original ACEs study showed that childhood trauma was very common, even in your kind of standard employed white middle class college educated people with great health insurance, lots and lots of high ACE, study, ACE scores. They found that there was a direct link between childhood trauma and adult onset of chronic disease, as well as depression, suicide, being violent themselves, and being a victim of violence. <laughs> 
More types of trauma increase the risk of health, social, and emotional problems. The more trauma you had, the more health, social, and emotional problems you also experienced. People usually experience more than one type of trauma. Rarely was it only one category. Usually scores were higher. Here's a breakdown comparing men and women and the incidence of childhood trauma. You notice that of those who reported no experience of trauma, there were more men than women in that group. There were also more men than women that reported one or two ACE events. But when you get to three or four or more to the poly victim of trauma, women clearly have much higher rates than men in those categories. One of the doctors who's written research on the topic, Vincent Folletti, uh, has a nice quote here that adverse childhood experiences are the most basic and long-lasting cause of health risk behaviors, mental illness, social malfunction, disease, disability, death, and health care costs. It really is all about the ACEs when you're trying to predict overall trends to poor health. You'll see here in this graphic the mechanism by which adverse childhood experiences can influence your health and well-being throughout your entire life lifespan. Starting at the bottom, you have your ACE event, which can lead to impaired neurodevelopment, which can lead to social, emotional, and cognitive impairment, which can lead to health risk behaviors as coping mechanisms, which leads to disease, disability, and social problems, and eventually early death. Starting at childhood really leads to lifelong health problems. Here are various categories that are directly out of the original ACEs study. You'll notice that people are more likely to perpetrate domestic violence if they have high ACE scores. Chronic depression is higher among the higher ACE scores. Teen sexual behavior, including early intercourse, teen pregnancy, and teen paternity, all higher with higher ACE scores. And suicide attempts, much higher in ACE-heavy patients. Higher rates of COPD, and obviously smoking as an adult, which is highly related to it, both higher with multiple ACE events. And liver disease, which you would tie to chronic alcoholism, alcoholism later in life, much higher the higher your ACE score is. They compared antidepressant uh, prescription rates among higher ACE scores, and you see that there's a positive relationship there. And then childhood experiences and the likelihood of being raped later in life, much higher in the high ACE event uh, patients, as well as impaired worker performance, really affects high-risk behavior, putting yourself in vulnerable, vulnerable positions, and your work performance later in life. It really affects everything. And then after that, there are four clusters of symptoms that kids and adults can experience. So the first one is what we call re-experiencing symptoms, where kids have thoughts and images about the traumatic event kind of stuck in their head going over and over again. So what that could look like in a child in the classroom is distraction. So they might seem sort of spacey, disinterested, and that might be because they're preoccupied with these sort of images or thoughts about a traumatic event. The next cluster of symptoms is what we call avoidance. So avoidance of people, places, things, activities that remind kids of the trauma. So if something about the classroom or the teacher or the peers in the class reminds the child of the trauma, they, it could become paired and they could want to avoid that. So we want to think about avoidance, maybe coming on late to a call, truancy, that kind of thing. Considering it from a trauma perspective, what, what is he or she avoiding? What, what might be triggered by coming to class? 
The third cluster of symptoms is changes in thoughts and feelings. So typical feelings we'll see will be uh, sadness, anxiety, irritability, but also numbness. So kind of like no um, emotion at all, pretty flat. And then the changes in thoughts, there tend to be two types of changes in thoughts. One where you change, they're called assimilation beliefs. But what that really means is like you, you blame yourself. It's too hard to change your, your working model for the way the world works. So you're like, this just must be my fault and the world is fine. It's just I made a mistake. Or something called over-accommodation beliefs, which is where you say, the world is bad. People are bad. You know, I'm not in control. I can't trust anyone. Um, and so what we really want to help kids to do is to ideally in trauma treatment, we find the, the balance, the way to um, find the middle path there. Um, but it, those kinds of extreme thoughts would be an example of a PTSD reaction. Then the last cluster of symptoms is uh, physiological hyperarousal. So um, being on high alert, sort of really on guard for danger in your environment, then sort of a quick snappy kind of response, maybe irritability. So that might look like a child who's being oppositional or who is being rude to the teacher, but that's not necessarily what's happening. From a trauma care kind of perspective, what we want to think is, um, what happened? Why is he doing that? Rather than, you know, why is he, you know, he's a bad kid. Um, what could have happened to make him feel so irritable right now or be so snappy? So that is sort of the gist of the trauma care perspective. And what we want to do is, again, consider those symptoms and consider that a child may have been through something really difficult when interpreting a student or child's behavior. Of course, Dr. Howard's presentation is speaking about school-age children and the effects of the COVID pandemic on their remote learning and their in-classroom learning and how these stressors can affect their behavior. But it's very easy for us to translate these same PTSD symptoms to the patients that we see on a regular basis. Now, in addition to the idea of uh, ACEs and the effect of trauma on behavior, there's a companion concept of the idea of resilience. Fortunately for us as humans, our brains and lives are somewhat plastic. Uh, we can use a number of our factors in our upbringing as means of resisting the effects of trauma. So our ability to ask for help and having a support system there, being able to develop trusting relationships with people, being able to form a positive attitude and listening to feelings, these are all factors that lead to greater resilience among people. And that resilience can lead to the uh, ability to endure and cope with trauma at a higher level. So in 2006 and then again in 2013, researchers began to develop an assessment tool to measure resilience by asking questions on 14 various dimensions. And patients were asked to rate on a scale of definitely true all the way through to definitely not true. I'll give you a chance to read through these items on the resilience scale. For each item on the skill that was either definitely true or probably true, you would add one point to resilience score. And then for each one of those items, you would add another point if it is still true for you as an adult. One of the original uh, academics on this study by the name of Rames uh, actually expressed some regret about the resilience scale 
uh, mostly because it has taken on a life of its own and people are viewing this measurement as some kind of a diagnostic tool that applies to everyone. Uh, and what Reigns wants people to realize is that this is just a guide for thinking about these issues. And there are many other ways of measuring resilience and dealing with the effect of ACEs on people's uh, lives, emotional and physical health. A secure early childhood is helpful, but it's not necessary in order to be resilient. And a higher number of positive experiences is not necessarily more protective of a person in being able to cope with trauma later in life. There are a number of things that we do here at Lifestar in order to try to provide a resilient organization for our providers and employees. We place a very high premium on safety, both safe operations, safety in our stations, and safety while doing our job. We prioritize physical, emotional, and psychological safety of our people. We share training and resources on how to respond safely to events and to stay safe. And we ensure that supervisors are checking in with staff often, asking, what are you doing and what do you need in order to do your job effectively? We also strive to remain a transparent organization. We over communicate and share as much information as possible about what's going on and what we anticipate the future to hold. We also try and give you a voice. You have an open door policy and we encourage and respect you reaching out to anybody in the organization. You're not only required to go to your individual supervisor, you can talk to any field educator, any supervisor, or any other staff in order to express your concerns or raise any issues. We also make sure that everyone knows how to access the Employee Assistance Program. It's a very robust program. Uh, it's very private. When you access the Employee Assistance Program, uh, we do not find out what issues you are confronting. It is between you and the uh, people at the Employee Assistance Program to work out those issues. And we try and celebrate the wins and create a positive environment as best we can. We deal with a lot of negative things in this business. We see a lot of bad outcomes. We see a lot of bad choices. We try to also celebrate the good things. So when our people do well, we try and recognize it. Uh, we have the impressions function on Paylocity for the daily affirmations and, and slapping each other on the back and saying good job. And we also try and recognize some of the more significant positive things that ha happen out there, including clinical excellence awards and life-saving awards. Here are a couple major resources for you to consult with regard to both trauma-informed organizations, as well as creating resilience in an organization. The next topic we want to talk about is how we respond to sexual assault EMS calls, which is a continuation of the previous topic, as well as some skills and protocols that you need to keep in mind when you're responding to a sexual assault. A sexual assault is any form of sexual contact or conduct with another person without their consent or if they don't have the ability to give consent because of their age, because of cognitive disability, or incapacitated by drugs or alcohol, whether voluntarily or involuntarily, which means that even if, if they are influenced by drugs or alcohol, even if they appear to consent, if they are intoxicated, they are unable to consent. So legally, that could be construed as sexual assault. This includes unwanted genital touching, kissing or making any unwanted contact to the body, attempted or completed penetration, forced masturbation by the victim or to the assailant, and forced participation in viewing or involvement of pornography. The word rape is a legal term. It is not a medical, uh, a medical term. And for that reason, we need to be careful in how we document things and the words that we choose. Rape refers to any penetration of a body orifice, be it mouth, vagina, or anus, involving force or threat of force or incapacity, again. 
The National Crime Victimization Survey is a survey that is longitudinal, which means it takes place over time, and it occurs every year. It's conducted by the Bureau of Justice Statistics in the Department of Justice. The National Crime Victimization Survey is different than looking at reported crimes to the police because instead of looking at police reports and police statistics, this is a survey that is sent directly to the public and asked, have you ever been a victim of this kind of crime? Has this ever happened to you? It doesn't matter whether or not they ultimately called the police to report it. And as we know colloquially, sexual assault is frequently not reported to the police. So this is considered in social sciences to be a much more accurate measure of the amount of crime that is happening because you're asking people directly, have you ever been a victim of this? And we're not relying on law enforcement agencies to report these statistics. Here's an example of violent victimization and violent crime from 1993 to, through 2018. And you'll notice that the crimes reported to police is at a much lower level than victimizations. So that top line is the actual incidence of crime that's measured by this study. And the lower level is the statistical summaries reported by police in those same categories. You can see there's a downward trend from 93 to 2018 overall in both categories. Fortunately, victimizations is approaching the police report line much more. So people are more likely to report these victimizations to the police, but it is still a much higher amount of crime that's happening than crime that gets reported. Here's a much more detailed look, and this is available from the Bureau of Justice Statistics in the Department of Justice. And that top line of rape and sexual assault is the one I'm focusing on from 2014 all the way to through the most recent uh, compilation of these statistics, which is 2018. And you notice that in the rate per 1,000, we have 1.1 1 .1 in 2014, and all the way over on the right, it more than doubles to 2.7 per 1,000. The raw number is 284,000 in 2014, up to 734,000 in 2018. So rape and sexual assault is dramatically increasing, even though overall violent crime is decreasing over the same time period. What are the best practices for an EMS response to a sexual assault call? We really have two objectives that are going on at the same time. Of course, primarily, we should provide quality emergency medical services and care to the sexual assault victim. But also, we have a concern for the preservation of evidence. We should not let the preservation of evidence take precedence over the victim, but we do have two objectives in mind. On scene, of course, as always, your safety comes first. In this kind of call, what that means is you should not respond to a sexual assault call until dispatch has verified that the perpetrator is no longer there and police are on scene. If you don't have any information about whether the scene is safe yet, you should not continue all the way to the scene until you verify that it is safe. Second, while on scene, it's not your role to decide whether or not an assault has occurred. If they say they were assaulted, for our purposes, they were assaulted. When it comes to patient evaluation, you need to respect all the boundaries that are set by the patient during your assessment, both physical, emotional, and social boundaries. There's no correct patient response to being sexually assaulted, so you need to read between the lines and interpret the patient's responses to your questions. Both male and vi female victims can be the victim of sexual assault, and they require compassion and professional assessment and treatment. Providing care to the patient should be non-judgmental and reassuring. The interview should be brief, and it should be focused on their injuries, not on the events leading up to the injuries. So, for example, you would not 
ask about mechanism of injury to you as an EMS term here nearly as much as you would in an auto accident. In an auto accident, we might ask which direction were you traveling, how fast were you going, and so on. In this case, we're not as concerned about the mechanism. We're interested in the injuries that they suffered. So the question should be about where are you hurt? Where are you bleeding? Things like that. Details of the assault other than the injury sustained are not really pertinent for the, hosp the pre-hospital record. This is an important legal factor as well. The way in which you interpret a victim's statement about things that happened prior to the injury and the way in which you choose to write it down could have an impact later on down the road when police are attempting to prosecute somebody for the crime. So you want to leave that stuff up to the experts and how they write it down. You want to focus on the injuries, not on all those events. When it comes to managing the patient, it is very helpful in building a trust relationship if you give them a lot of choices. You never want to touch them without asking permission first. And I also find it helpful to ask lots of questions that in other contexts would almost seem silly. But here what you're doing is you're building an environment of safety and trust between you and the patient. Things like, would you rather sit here or would you rather sit there? It, would you want me to use your right arm for a blood pressure or your left arm for a blood pressure? Would you like me to turn the lights up or down in the ambulance? Is it okay if I put the seat of the cot further up? You may not actually need answers to all those questions, but by giving the patient the ability to say yes or no and to control as much as what's happening in the back of the ambulance as possible helps to build a safe environment for them. Don't forget the fact that in many sexual assaults there is strangulation that can occur and you cannot always tell if they were strangled simply by looking at their neck for signs of outward injury. So you want to evaluate their speaking, their swallowing, and their breathing as a means of determining whether or not any strangulation occurred. Do not ask them to undress on scene to collect their clothing. If you have to remove clothing in order to perform an assessment because they're bleeding on the leg or arm and you need to remove that clothing, uh, or you can see an injury or you need to uh, take a blood pressure and they're wearing outer clothing, all of that clothing that gets removed should be set aside. The appropriate container for that would be a paper bag. You should never place clothing of a sexual assault victim in a plastic bag. It can degrade the quality of the evidence. If the patient permits, you can examine the area of injury, but in the absence of severe hemorrhage, it would not be appropriate to have to visualize the genitalia for any reason. Exceptions to the way in which we normally treat some kinds of injuries uh, are bite wounds. We would not rinse out a bite wound. You would simply cover it with sterile gauze, tape the gauze down, and leave it there because it's possible to collect evidence from a bite wound. You don't want to rinse with saline or sterile water, and you don't want to put any antibiotic ointments over that kind of injury. You should never allow food or drink to the patient. Oral assault may have occurred, and the patient should avoid brushing their teeth, gargling, or allowing anything into their mouth until a forensic examiner can take samples. If the patient has somebody on scene that's providing them with emotional support, you should allow that person to transport with you if that's what the patient wants. When it comes to transporting the patient, you also th have to think about what the appropriate medical destination would be. You need to make sure that there is a sexual assault nurse examiner program at your destination hospital. Many hospital systems have a SANE nurse that is on call and will travel to the ER wherever you're going. Other hospitals do not have a SANE nurse, and for that reason you should not transport to that hospital with a sexual assault victim. You need to relay information to the receiving emergency department that there is concern for sexual assault so that they can page the same nurse if they have an on-call nurse. 
You want to be careful in how you do that and the language in which you choose. Many of us will use the phrase chief complaint of SA. Most nurses should recognize that. And if they don't recognize it, hopefully they're quick enough on the uptake to figure out why you're being obscure about what your chief complaint is. You want to be discreet in how you talk to the ER. Some of the hospitals that we transport to, uh, St. Agnes does have a SANE program, but not for pediatrics. So in the event of a pediatric sexual assault, that patient should go to Children's Madison or Children's Milwaukee. UW-Madison has a uh, SANE program on site. Frederick Main Campus also can take adult patients. Frederick West Bend and Frederick Community Falls have on-call SANE nurses. Children's Milwaukee or Madison would be appropriate for any pediatric patient that's a victim of sexual assault. And Aurora Sinai is the leading sexual assault treatment emergency department in the state of Wisconsin. They have a program for evidence collection that is superior to any other hospital in the state. If possible, you can transport there if you're anywhere close to Milwaukee area. Keep in mind when it comes to documentation that patient care reports are likely to be read by many legal and medical authorities. They might wind up in court. You want to be very careful how you document everything. You want your report to appear professional and thorough, free of spelling and grammar errors, and free of guessing and judgment, and factually based. It should be succinct and pertinent. Uh, no observations that are not relevant to the injuries of the patient. The possibility of being subpoenaed to testify in these kinds of cases is quite high. You want to write the patient care report as a reminder to yourself. Write it in a way so that if you read this six months or a year from now, you're going to remember the pertinent details. Don't use the word alleged sexual assault as your impression. Your impression should be sexual assault if that's what the patient said, period. The term rape and the term choked are legal terms. They are not medical terms. So you should use the appropriate medical terms of sexual assault and strangulation if those are appropriate for the patient care report. Being accurate in your terminology will reflect on your professionalism and will give you credibility if you're called upon to testify. As somebody who has been subpoenaed in a number of cases, it's important for you also to remember that being subpoenaed might mean you are only there to introduce the first steps of what's going on in the legal process, and you may not be asked to provide expert testimony, so you shouldn't experience a high level of stress if you're subpoenaed. Sometimes you're there just because you were there at the beginning of the story that the prosecutor is trying to tell. If the patient voluntarily discloses to you that they were in fear of being killed or being threatened with a weapon, uh, or they have a loss of memory of events of the assault, you can include those statements in your patient care report, but they should be in direct quotes to indicate clearly that these are the patient's comments and not your interpretations. You might also want to add a comment about where the sexual assault took place in order to set the scene. You can also use the body map function in ESO software in order to indicate where you find injuries on the patient. It's much more detailed than trying to describe in words proximal, uh, lateral, medial, distal. Those are great terms, but a picture tells a thousand words. If you are called into the actual scene of the sexual assault, remember you're on a crime scene. Watch where you step, watch what you touch, and watch where you put things. If you don't have to bring your bag into the actual room where the crime occurred, put the bag down in the hallway so that you're not interfering with any evidence collection. If you're asked to collect pertinent scene items, their clothing, towels, and so on, Place each item in its own paper bag if you have one and label it with the patient name. Do not use plastic bags. It degrades organic materials. And once you collect something and begin to treat it as evidence, you now have a chain of custody. 
That means you have to document that you collected the item, where you put it, and exactly who you gave it to. And in this case, a first name and last initial for a nurse would not be enough. You need the full name of the person that you gave it to. And then document it in your report and obtain signatures. If the patient needs to urinate or vomit, that is evidence. You want to preserve it in a sterile clean container. So whatever urine specimen container you have uh, or the vomit bag, you want to hold onto that. That would be evidence of drugs that may have been used in the sexual assault. Any on-scene containers that the patients may believe or believes may have been used in drugging should also be col collected and custody maintained. That would usually be done by law enforcement, but if you're in the position to have to have done it, then you should be the one to do it. Most likely law enforcement is going to take any evidence on scene and frankly it should be a relief to you to be able to hand that over to the law enforcement officer before you leave. But if you're asked to do any of the above things, chain of custody must be done and must be maintained properly. Here's another series of very good resources that you may want to uh, consult if you want to do some more reading about properly responding to a sexual assault call.